Chapter 13, When Reactants Turn Into Products. We're going to look at reaction mechanisms. This is the sequence of steps that molecules undergo while changing from reactants to products. We can see an example here. We have chemical kinetics, which is the study of how chemical reaction rates change, and substitution reactions, which is a reaction in which an atom or group of atoms replaces another atom or group of atoms in a molecule, as seen here. Chemical reactions normally exhibit a net change in energy. That energy can be released in several forms, including light and heat. Here we see nitroglycerin producing energy. The energy can be released or absorbed by a chemical reaction. We have several, several different types that we're going to cover. Exothermic reactions release energy to the surroundings. Endothermic absorb energy from the surroundings. And energy neutral reactions either release, neither release nor absorb energy. Let's look at the energy reaction profile. This is a graph that represents the energy change that occurs during a chemical reaction. If we have reactants that start at a high energy and end at a low energy, we can see that energy is released during the reaction. We look at the net energy change. The change in the energy of a reaction is positive in endothermic reactions and negative for exothermic reactions. You will need to remember that. For the following reaction profile, is this exothermic or endothermic? We start at 58 kilojoules per mole and we end at 18. That reaction would be exothermic as the products have a lower energy than the reactants. Our chemical bonds actually store energy. Breaking a bond requires the addition of energy, we covered that in earlier chapters, and forming bonds releases energy into the surroundings. The relationship between the magnitudes of bond forming and bond breaking energies defines the overall reaction type. We can see the bond breaking in the first example absorbing a lot of energy, and that bond formation releasing very little energy, that's endothermic. In an exothermic reaction, the bond breaking absorbs very little energy, but the formation releases a lot of energy. For the combustion of hydrogen, the um, change in the energy of the reaction is negative 479 kilojoules. If the energy absorbed breaking the reactant bonds is 1370 kilojoules, how much energy is released when the product bond forms? Well, since the energy of the reaction is negative, the energy is released in the overall reaction. So the energy released by forming the product is 1,849 kilojoules, which is the 1370 plus 479. The definition of activation energy is the energy that must be overcome for a reaction to move forward. It is shown as peaks in the uh, reaction profiles as seen here. We have the reactants, the top of the energy barrier, and we drop down to products. The difference between the reactants and the top of that energy barrier is the energy activation energy. Then we have transition state. This is the state of the reactants at the top of the activation energy peak. Reactant bonds are just beginning to break and product bonds are just beginning to form. The magnitude of activation energy is as follows. If we have a very large activation energy, this will give rise to a very slow reaction. If we have a very small activation energy, it will give rise to a very fast activation. So what do you think about these two? Which of the following reactants would be expected to go faster? The one with the smaller activation energy or the one with the very large activation energy? The first reaction would proceed faster because, as we just mentioned, it has a smaller activation energy. Temperature also has an effect on um, the reaction rates. The temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of molecules. The higher the temperature, the faster those molecules are going to move and the more collisions that are going to occur. The higher the temperature, the more molecules um, present with enough energy to react as well. The orientation effects on reaction rates are as follows. 
Molecules must collide with the correct orientation in order to, create, to react, as you can see in this backside approach. We also have something called catalysts. Catalysts can be added to increase the reaction rate by lowering the activation energy. They are not used up or changed during the reaction. They're just there to lower that activation energy, as you can see on the top here. We talk about enzymes quite a bit, especially in the medical laboratory. We have enzymes in your body that help chemical reactions. We also use enzymes in the chemicals we use on our analyzers to make reactions happen. Enzymes are biomolecules in all living systems. They have an active site and require a substrate. The active site is a pocket in the enzyme where the reaction occurs, and the substrate is a molecule that fixes into that active site of the enzyme. We'll see some pictures here in a minute. We call this a lock and key mechanism. It's a selective catalytic activity of enzymes based on their molecular shape. So here's the lock and key. You can see we have an enzyme with an active site over here and other molecules, but only certain ones will fit, which is the purple ones in this scenario. Here's an example of an enzyme catalyzed splitting of sucrose. We eat sucrose in our diet. Let's say you eat a Twinkie. Okay, Twinkie's full of sucrose. Your body needs enzymes to break this apart in order to turn it into glucose and fructose. Glucose is the usable energy of our cells. Enzymes are required for that split as shown in this model. But only one enzyme called fructase is capable of doing this. So increasing the concentration of reactants will increase the number of collisions. We can see here that the reaction rate is the total number of collisions per unit time times the fraction of those collisions with energy equal to the greater equal to or greater than the activation energy times the fraction of collisions in which those molecules have proper orientation. Therefore, the reaction rate will also increase. So we need to understand orders in a general rate law. And with this we're going to talk about some different orders, and I just want you to memorize um, the definitions of them. So we'll get to that in a second. But orders do not come from the coefficients in a balanced chemical equation. They come from kinetic experiments in which the concentrations of reactants are varied and the reaction is studied over time. This is something we actually do in the clinical chemistry laboratory, and you'll be performing it next quarter in clinical chemistry one. So here, the rate equals the change in product concentration over time. So here's what I want you to essentially memorize for now, and we're going to go into more detail from a clinical chemistry standpoint next quarter. An order of zero is a chemical reaction in which the rate of reactions is constant and independent of the concentration of the reacting substances. In a first order, or order of one, means there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the reaction concentration and rate. An order of two means the rate quadruples when the concentration of the reactants is doubled. So the reaction mechanism illustrates what actually occurs during the chemical reaction using elementary steps. Those elementary steps are steps that a reaction undergoes shown by collisions of two molecules at a time. Each elementary step will have its own law rate. So in order to find the mechanism for a reaction, we must work backwards to understand the mechanism. We find the reaction rate for the overall reaction using the kinetic studies, and we postulate a mechanism that would give rise to the reaction rate that was found. The mechanism should be drawn out using elementary steps with the two molecule collisions only. Here are three mechanisms. We have a predicted rate law, which is a rate law postulated by a proposed reaction mechanism. We have experimental rate law, which was determined experimentally. And then lastly, the rate determining step. I want you to know the definition for this. It's the, low, the slowest step in any reaction mechanism. It defines the overall reaction kinetics. Here's an example of an hourglass. The step A to B will determine the overall rate of the reaction. 